West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Well, one reason that the National Archives knew that Donald Trump did not hand over all presidential records when he left the White House was that some of the most famous documents of the Trump presidency were not delivered to the archives after Joe Biden's inauguration day. First among them was the very first document Donald Trump received as president, a handwritten letter from President Barack Obama to his successor that, by tradition, as everyone knows, is tucked into a drawer in the desk in the Oval Office for the incoming president. It was public information on Inauguration Day in 2017 that President Obama left that letter for Donald Trump, who said it was, quote, a beautiful letter. He actually said that about the President Obama letter to him. And then there were the letters that became possibly the most famous presidential letters in history. The Trump love letters. I got a very beautiful letter from Kim Jong-un. He really wrote a beautiful three-page I mean, right from top to bottom, a really beautiful letter. Donald Trump never said very much about the text of those letters from the North Korean dictator, but he was never shy about the feelings expressed in those letters. We fell in love, okay? No, really. He wrote me beautiful letters, and they're great letters. We fell in love. For most of us, that was just more Trumpian buffoonery. That was just Donald Trump opening up like that about love letters from a murderous di dictator was, for most of us, just yet another one of those moments when we knew he was crazy, but we didn't know he was that crazy. But imagine, imagine you're a senior archivist at the National Archives and you're watching the news that night on September 29th, 2018. And you see and hear Donald Trump say about Kim Jong-un, he wrote me beautiful letters and had great letters. We fell in love. You're an archivist. You know those letters are coming your way at some point. Do you jump off the sofa at home when you hear that? Do you spill whatever you were drinking when you hear Donald Trump say that? That he has beautiful letters from Kim Jong-un? He has love letters from the murderous North Korean dictator who starves his people? From that moment forward, every archivist working at the National Archives, who knew that they were going to see eventually the Trump presidential papers 
had to be planning on day one of delivery of the Trump presidential papers an immediate high-speed search for the Trump love letters with Kim Jong-un. But the Trump presidential papers showed up at the end of the Trump presidency and the love letters weren't there. President Obama's letter to Donald Trump wasn't there. And that's when the archives lawyers started asking the Trump lawyers for the rest of Donald Trump's presidential papers, not knowing how much more Donald Trump had been illegally holding back at that point and keeping in his possession. But they knew that he had the love letters and he had the President Obama letter. The Washington Post is reporting tonight on an email they have exclusively obtained from the chief counsel of the National Archives, Gary Stern, to Trump lawyers four months after Donald Trump left office with the subject line, need for assistance, Ray, presidential records. Gary Stern had apparently been in communication with Trump's White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, who apparently agreed that there were presidential records that still needed to be delivered to the National Archives. Gary Stern's email to the Trump lawyers four months after the Trump presidency presidency says, it is also our understanding that roughly two dozen boxes of original presidential records were kept in the residence of the White House over the course of President Trump's last year in office and have not been transferred to the National Archives despite a determination by Pat Cipollone in the final days of the administration that they need to be. The Washington Post reports that in his email, Stern cites at least two high-profile documents that the archives knew at the time were missing. Letters from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and a letter from former President Barack Obama at the beginning of Trump's presidency. That's how the investigation of Donald Trump's illegal possession of presidential records and other governmental records, including classified records, began. It was about the love letters. The archives wanted to know where is that traditional letter from the outgoing president to the incoming president and where are the love letters with Kim Jong-un. In that first email, archives attorney Gary Stern seemed to know something about the love letters already. He seemed to know that Donald Trump had specifically decided to take personal possession of the love letters in his very final days in office. The Washington Post reports that attorney Gary Stern, quote, did cite the correspondence between Trump and Kim as an example of an item the former president requested just prior to the end of the administration Stern wrote, it is our understanding that in January 2021, just prior to the end of the administration, the originals were put in a binder for the president, but were never returned to the Office of Records Management for the National Archives. So already, just a few months after Donald Trump left office, people who worked in the Trump White House were obviously already informing the National Archives about exactly when Donald Trump took personal possession of the Kim Jong-un love letters. The National Archives spent the rest of that full year trying to get those documents back and whatever else Donald Trump had. And we now know that at the end of that first year out of office, Donald Trump personally looked through the boxes of government records at his Florida home. The New York Times reported Mr. Trump went through the boxes himself in late 2021, according to multiple people briefed on his efforts before turning them over. And then, one year after Donald Trump left office, And after Donald Trump personally went through all those boxes at the end of 2021, 
15 boxes of documents were returned to the National Archives from Donald Trump's Florida home and still, still Donald Trump was illegally keeping more classified government records and other government records in his home. And so the National Archives got the Justice Department involved and federal prosecutors working with FBI agents issued a subpoena for all the rest of the records that could be remaining at Donald Trump's home. And in early June, federal prosecutors and FBI agents visited Donald Trump's home in a scheduled visit with Donald Trump's lawyers, where Donald Trump's lawyers handed over even more documents to return to the archives. And then one of the Trump lawyers, Christina Bob, actually signed a written statement saying, that's it. That's all the material that we have here. You now have it all. Signed her name to that. No more government records, no more classified material left in the home after that day in June. Federal investigators became convinced very quickly that that was not true. And then they convinced a Florida federal judge to issue a search warrant of Donald Trump's home for evidence of illegal possession of government records and illegal possession of classified records and evidence of obstruction of justice. And that search was carried out on August 8th. Tomorrow, that same federal judge in Florida will decide how much of that, of what the FBI told him about the possible crimes in this case can be revealed to the public. Judge Bruce Reinhardt will consider releasing the FBI affidavit or portions of it that convinced him to issue the search warrant tomorrow after a 12 noon deadline tomorrow that he imposed on the Justice Department, asking the Justice Department to submit to him suggested redactions to the affidavit to protect individual sources and other possible sensitive issues raised in that FBI affidavit. Judge Reinhardt has said that it is possible that the redactions would have to be so extensive that there would be no real point in releasing an almost fully redacted affidavit. The judge could decide as early as tomorrow afternoon about whether the affidavit can be released and in what form, but what will not be released tomorrow afternoon or probably ever are the Trump love letters, which are classified material. It is Thursday, the 25th of August of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Butnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Just a little bit. Only a little. Well, it looks like uh, there's quite a few people up in arms because Joe Biden didn't do enough. He didn't, like, wipe every student loan slate clean. Why, Joe? Why? I actually think that this is a great step in the right direction. And I say step because there's going to be more steps because that's how it works. Wake up. Okay. I mean, I just think, like, the cap on interest is something that people should be talking about a lot more. If you're going to talk about it at all. And we also know that the Pell Grant de designation really does benefit mostly women of color. And that is why everybody's upset. <laughs> why do they get relief? Why? Why? All right. Well, no one, no one in the Republican circles whined one bit when Donald Trump open the money spigot to pay off farmers who really were savagely uh, treated and lost a lot of money because of Trump's tariff war. Because he doesn't understand how tariffs work. This is another example of somebody who doesn't know shit about America, our system of government, trying to make things up as he goes along. I hear this a lot. Oh, well, you know, uh, the rules are made to be broken. Yeah, well, that's because you don't even know what the rules are. 
So then when you do break them, you think, uh, oh, it's okay. I'm inventing the wheel. The wheel's already been invented, pal. And we do this over and over and over, and we bail them out. They tank the economy, and we bail them out. They tank us in wars, and we bail them out, and then we get blamed for it. Already there are, I guess we'll call them the hard left. I don't know what to call them. They are just up in arms, and they're not going to give Joe any respite. Yeah, well, go to Mitch McConnell and whine about it. Please. Another reason why they're whining is because this whole student debt relief package part and parcel is what Kamala Harris has been working on for a few decades. It is her policy. And that is why (laughs) a lot of, uh, I gotta tell you, men are up in arms. Yeah, there's a few white gals, too. And we know why. Yes, we do. But, you know, we could speak about... This is actually a great win, and it it will be uh, disseminated as such. It's going to be all these whiners, though, because... I guess they're not going to vote for Joe, so they're going to vote for the fascists? Please. I'm going to tell you, if you see what happened in party politics in Nazi Germany, you know, as the Nazis came to power, and how was it that they were able to take over because they used the mechanisms of their government against it, just like it's happening now. It's a tried and true technique. Use the rules and regulations to destroy the rules and regulations. The very fabric of what it means to be part of a nation. And recreate it as your own. Okay. So we had 50 years of Roe v. Wade, and at the snap of a finger, now we don't. And uh, if you even think about having an abortion, you will be thrown in jail. For attempted murder, conspiracy to commit murder, you thought about it. Miscarriages are all criminal acts until proven otherwise. Innocent until proven guilty unless you're pregnant. (laughs) Then all bets are off. Okay. So we could be talking maybe about the fact that Donald Trump is a Russian spy. And he's selling state secrets. And he's also holding state secrets as leverage, as in, you know, blackmail. To get what he wants, when he wants it, and uh, continue what he's been doing. A guy who had already spoke about this behavior in Art of the Deal acquire as much bad information about your opponent and your friends so that you can use it against them when the time comes. And this guy was privy to state secrets on the granular level. And they're his now, he says. I want my top secrets back. He always refers to him as President Trump, by the way, as if he is still... The office holder just, uh, well, you know, he's in exile, though. I'm the true president. I'm in exile. And millions upon millions of people believe it. And there are electeds and those being elected right now to perpetuate this lie and destroy the United States of America. Last week, 400,000 bucks was not rich. Today, 125 is too rich. They have no moral grounds to argue with us, so why do we argue with them? Now, Charlie Crist, former Republican, let's remember this, 
is insistent that as divisive and bombastic and whatever that DeSantis is, Christ is going to run a respectful campaign that will unify. Yes. And I would, I, I, I respect that, but I also respect the unity that comes when you punch the Nazis. Ah. <sighs> So I'm hoping that he doesn't like DeSantis just get away with it. I understand that, you know, you don't want to get in there slinging mud because it's unseemly. But trust me, Chris will be forced to sling mud before it's over. It always happens. So my attitude is punch the Nazis and don't be embarrassed about it. There is no unity. I <laughs> I wish that I could just explain this in a non-emotional way, but I can't. There are certain types of people that you are never going to be able to come to a middle ground with. It's either their way or the highway. They may tell you what you want to know, but they're going to stab you in the back. And that is what a Nazi does. We have historical precedent to back it up. There's no making nice with Nazis. Oh, let's sing Oh, Silent Night during Christmas. Let's come together. No, they want to kill you. They'll put up with you as long as it takes just so they can get what they want. Do you really think Herschel Walker is going to be allowed in their bomb shelter? Please. He's being used, and we all know it. Too bad Herschel doesn't. Or maybe he does and he doesn't care, which is more likely the case. This is how they work. And the sooner we accept that and understand that, yeah, we can run respectful campaigns that are un will unify and are dignified. But there is also no dignity in having your face ground in the pavement by an iron boot. Goose stepping all over the Constitution of the United States of America. Do you like that hyperbole? I do. I'm not talking about fighting in the streets. But I'm also not talking about giving up the streets. I'm not talking about uh, appeasement. Everything's fine. You can go to bed now. Neville Chamberlain said so. When you got a little fascist like DeSantis threatening that he's going to chuck Fauci across the Potomac. Fauci's 5'7", DeSantis is 5'9". Why don't we just chuck DeSantis into the Potomac and call it a baptism? And maybe people will be happy. I often wondered why there were always low-angled shots, you know, uh, pic pictures looking up at DeSantis from below to make him look bigger. Now we know why. I know there's a lot of five nine guys out there, but you know I'm I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about somebody like DeSantis, who I thought was a little Napoleon, overcompensating. Yeah, Kerry Lake says he has big dick energy. No, he has little dick energy. There's all everything about that guy is compensation, overly so. I'm going to chuck that elf in across the Potomac. Yeah, well, that elf was a public servant and a Republican, by the way. For decades, uh, kept us safe. He had a evolution during the AIDS crisis. Where he came to understand that ACT UP and other activist organizations were, well, well they had it right. So that's why 
he was so effective in being able to, you know, control that epidemic, pandemic, as well as it is. And that's not all. There's been all sorts of health hazards that have occurred during his tenure. And he's been a hero. But because he didn't kiss ass to Donald Trump, they want to chuck him across the Potomac because he's a little elf. They want to burn the expert at the stake. And then we're not supposed to call them Nazis. We're supposed to make nice with that. No. Can't be done. We vote them out. We marginalize their asses. We stop giving them the platform to be able to Nazi. Well, speaking of which, (laughs) as far as platforming, let us uh, dive into the uh, curated part of the show here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. It's looking like more and more that the love letters between Trump and Kim Jong-un going missing after Trump left office, that might have been what tipped off the National Archives. Hmm. On the rest of the menu, a Trump-friendly rodeo announcer's politically charged remarks at the Northwest Washington Fair dissatisfied hundreds of audience members with some vowing never to return. Ex-Interior Secretary Zinke lied to investigators in an Indian casino case. And President Joe Biden named the first woman as the next director of the Secret Service. After the break, we move to the chef's table where a Mexican judge accepted charges against the ex-prosecutor in the 2014 disappearance of 43 medical students. And Germany is exporting power to France while urging savings at home. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. going to forego the usual niceties here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy at this point in the show and tuck into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. It comes from the Cascadia Daily News by Audra Anderson. Thousands of people filled Linden's grandstands for the August 15 to 16 Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association Rodeo, but hundreds of audience members left dissatisfied and uncomfortable with some vowing never to return to the Northwest Washington Fair due to radio announcer Jody Carper's politically charged remarks. The PRCA rodeo took place amid the Northwest Washington Fair, a 10-day entertainment event that attracts visitors from around the region. Droves of rodeo attendees took to social media to express discomfort over Carper's divisive and insightful rhetoric. The rodeo began with a prayer, typical for the Linden Rodeo, but Carper made comments about how prayer is being taken out of schools, the first of many offhand remarks, attendees said. Mike Howe, age 32, attended the rodeo on Monday for the first time with his fiance. He said he expected some elements of the commentary, such as the traditional prayer for the safety of the cowboys and cowgirls, but 
Carper took it too far. The reason we came there was to watch a cool show, a cool event, House said. When you start having an announcer that is throwing personal beliefs into a show, it starts to overshadow the purpose of the event. Carper spent at least 20 minutes on a politically charged preamble, House said, including comments about being called a conspiracy theorist and protecting America. Carper, who touts himself as the Patriot announcer committed to helping save America on his website, did not respond to multiple requests for comment. Howe said Carper prefaced his commentary by saying his opinions are not endorsed by the fair and fair manager, Selena Burgess, told Cascadia Daily News in an email that they received an overwhelming positive response from two nights of a sold-out rodeo. We understand and respect that there are many differing viewpoints and all have the freedom to express them, she continued. Given the wide variety of entertainment options available at the fair, it is our hope that guests can find something that appeals to them. You know, the liberals can go to the haunted house. That's where they like to live, the evil devils. That's what she meant. Burgess did not respond to further questions and did not respond to multiple requests to speak to the president of the fair's board of directors, Mike Matt Koche, uh, or fair foundation president, Phyllis Kramer. And it's not Carper's first rodeo where he's landed himself in hot water. Just two weeks prior to the Linden event, Carper's remarks at the Chief Joseph Day's Rodeo in Joseph, Oregon, prompted a news story and multiple letters to the editor in the Wallowa County Chieftain. In an August 10 letter to the editor titled, A Rodeo, Not a Trump Rally, David Olmos of Portland wrote, I drove more than five hours each way to watch a rodeo and contribute to the local economy there by dining and lodging in Joseph. Not to listen to some guy spout his views on there are people trying to destroy our country, freedom of religion and prayer, and saying the code phrase, let's go, Brandon. Keep your political views to yourself. It's a rodeo, not a Trump rally, partner. Joseph resident Eric Pippert wrote in an August 10 letter, I'll take my rodeo served up without a side of jingoistic dog whistle political commentary with a sprinkling of misogynistic and racial tropes by the announcer and rodeo clown. Carver's remarks at Lyndon's rodeo left Howe and others disheartened. The rodeo should be an enjoyable and accessible to anyone regardless of political stance, Howe said. He does not plan to return to the rodeo next year. Lisa Ryan and Anna Phillips of the Washington Post brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Former Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke, who is favored to win a new House seat representing Montana this fall, lied to investigators several times about conversations he had with federal officials, lawmakers, and lobbyists about two Indian tribes' petition to operate a New England cons- casino, the department's watchdog said in a report released yesterday, Wednesday. Investigators with Inspector General Mark Greenblatt's office concluded that when questioned about his talks with interior attorneys and others outside the department, Zinke and his then chief of staff failed to comply with their duty of candor as public officials to tell the truth. We found, the report said, that both Secretary Zinke and the Chief of Staff made statements that presented an inaccurate version of the circumstances in which the Interior Department made key decisions, the report said. As a result, 
we concluded that Secretary Zinke and the Chief of Staff did not comply with their duty of candor when questioned. Investigators found that Zinke, who served one term in the House before joining the Trump administration and his chief of staff, made statements to OIG investigators with the overall intent to mislead them. In 2017, the Mashnatucket, Pequot, and Mohegan tribes wanted to open a casino in East Windsor, Connecticut, they petitioned Interior, asking department officials to approve amendments saying their plans to jointly operate the facility would not violate their existing gambling agreements. This sparked a lobbying campaign by MGM Resorts International, which operates a competing casino a short distance away to persuade Zinke not to sign off on the tribe's plans. The Inspector General's report found that from the spring to the fall of 2017, lobbyists and political consultants and a U.S. senator spoke repeatedly with Zinke and his chief of staff, urging them to reject the amendments. The report said that on one occasion, Zinke had dinner at his residence with a political consultant and a lobbyist. The lobbyist spent the evening texting a casino executive with updates on the discussions, and the inspector general found he lied about it all. Associated Press staff bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. President Joe Biden named Kim Cheadle, a veteran Secret Service official, to be the agency's next director as it faces controversy over missing text messages around the time thousands of supporters of Trump storm the U.S. Capitol. Cheadle, who left the Secret Service in 2021 for a job as a security executive at at PepsiCo, takes the reins as multiple congressional committees and the Department of Homeland Security's internal watchdog are investigating the missing text messages, which the Secret Service has said were purged during a technology transition. Cheadle had served in the Secret Service for 27 years and was the first woman to be named Assistant Director of Protective Operations, the division that provides protection to the President and other dignitaries. Cheadle had served on Biden's protective detail when he was Vice President. During that time, Biden came to trust her judgment and counsel, he said in a statement. Biden said that, Her and First Lady Jill Biden know firsthand Kim's commitment to her job and to the Secret Service's people and missions. Cheadle replaces Jim Murray, who announced his retirement to take a position with Snap, the social media company best known for its app Snapchat. He announced last month that he would delay his retirement amid the investigations while Biden looked for a new director. Well, now he's found one. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth.
Make sure you're registered to vote. Go to rockthevote.org. Vote for Democrats up and down the ticket. This message, a public service from all the fine people of netrootsradio.com. This is 60 Second Science. I'm Tulika Bose. You probably already know what a black hole is, but have you ever heard of the black hole information paradox? I'm here with Clara Moskowitz, our space and physics editor, who just edited a big special issue for Scientific American on black holes. Hey, Clara. Hi. Thanks for having me. So, Clara, what are we here to talk about today? We're here to talk about the black hole information paradox, which has been a problem in physics for a long time. Basically, black holes seem to break the rules of physics. And part of the reason why is because we have to use two different theories to describe them, and the two theories do not get along. On the one hand, we have quantum mechanics, which describes the world of the very small, atoms and particles. On the other hand, we have general relativity, which describes things that are very big, very massive, very large. And most things in the world don't require both theories. They're either big or they're small. Black holes are both. Black holes are the densest things in the entire universe, and they take up very little space, but they have so much mass. You really need both theories. And yet, when you try to combine quantum mechanics and general relativity, everything goes crazy. How can two rules of physics not apply? Each one works perfectly in its own realm. So quantum mechanics does very well describing everything that's that's subatomic, everything that we can't see that's very small. And general relativity works perfectly to describe very big things, like the motions of planets. But we almost never have to combine them in one example, except for black holes. Black holes take up very little space, but they have so much mass that general relativity and quantum mechanics equally apply. And yet, when you try to combine the two theories, they don't work together. But how exactly do they not work together? Basically, when you try to combine them, the equations break. They give infinities. They just don't produce answers or calculations that you can use, that you can work with. And it's a sign that something is missing. We don't fully understand something. And the thing that we don't fully understand is gravity. So quantum mechanics has been made to work very well with every other theory and every other force of nature. Quantum mechanics can describe electromagnetism and the strong and the weak force that works inside atoms, but it can't describe gravity. And yet, with black holes, you have something that's teensy tiny, and yet the gravity is super strong. And when we try to describe what's going on in them, we can't. We don't have a theory to tell us everything about how a black hole works. And we really don't understand what's going on inside them. How long have we known about this paradox? So this paradox dates back 50 years. And the story basically starts with Stephen Hawking. In 1974, he discovered that black holes leak. They let out radiation. Over time, particle by particle, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually, they completely disappear. Sounds weird, but... Okay. The problem is that if black holes can disappear, so can all the information about what fell into them. And that is a huge problem because that breaks the laws of physics. According to quantum mechanics, information can never be destroyed. You might think information is destroyed all the time when you shred an invoice or burn a book, for instance. But according to physics, if you had complete knowledge of the book, ahead of time, of every atom and every molecule within the book, then you could follow each atom and molecule through the burning process to see where they all ended up, and everything would be fine. But black holes aren't like this. If a black hole is destroyed, it's completely destroyed, and there's no way to access the information that it once held. And that can't be. That's a paradox. Wow. But obviously there's new information and new research. Can you tell me about it? Right. So for 50 years, scientists have been puzzling over this issue and trying to figure out what's going on and whether there's a way to save the information that's inside black holes. And finally, in the last few years, they've had a major breakthrough. The breakthrough involves several very mind-bending concepts. One of them is wormholes. 
which is bridges in space-time. These, these are shortcuts in space-time that connect two very distant points. And the other has to do with the weird rules of quantum mechanics. According to quantum mechanics, everything that can happen does happen. So a particle, for instance, doesn't just travel along a straight line from point A to point B. Instead, it takes all of the possible paths that could connect point A and point B. It circles up, it loops down, it twists around before arriving at point B. And all of those things happen simultaneously. Well, when you apply this concept to black holes, it means that you have to consider all of the possible arrangements of space-time within black holes because all of them are simultaneously real. And one of the possible arrangements of space-time is a wormhole. So these are these weird theoretical bridges, shortcuts in space and time. And there's a chance that the inside of a black hole is connected to the inside of another black hole through a wormhole. Well, you have to take this possibility, this chance, into account, physicists recently figured out. And when they did, everything changed. The equations that they used to describe the entropy in black holes, basically a description of the amount of disorder, gave a totally different answer. And they pointed to a solution for a way that information could escape black holes. And this way is called an island. Now, of all the weird things we've talked about already, this is the weirdest. This is the idea that deep within black holes, there's a special region called an island. And this region is both inside the black hole and also outside the black hole at the same time. And that the information that's within the island, since it's inside and outside, can escape the black hole's destruction and is never truly destroyed, even if the black hole evaporates away completely and disappears. And this seemed to resolve the paradox. So there are a lot of questions still to be answered. Everything's not totally settled. And not all physicists agree that this is the solution. But it definitely does seem to point a way forward toward resolving the paradox, showing how information can escape from black holes, and pointing us toward a future where we can describe black holes finally with a consistent physical theory. Just in case you want to know more about some of these really mind-bending concepts that we've been talking about, check out the September issue of Scientific American, where we have a bunch of articles describing in detail all of these new ideas, along with a really cool video that draws it out for you if you're a visual person and want to see what these things might look like. Thanks for listening. For 60 Second Science, I'm Talika Bose. I was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean when it happened. There was a sudden jolt and our submarine crashed on the seafloor. We were in total darkness. That's Dr. Dejana Figueroa, a marine biologist and STEM teacher, talking about a deep sea dive she'll never forget. It's funny, when I was a kid, I was afraid of the ocean. And there I was, two miles below the surface. But as a scientist, you prepare for that. Using our training and a little creativity, we fixed the sub and finished our experiments. The dive was just too important. Every dive gives us glimpses at things few people ever get to see. Blowing creatures, fiery undersea volcanoes. When we got back to the surface, I kissed the ground and called my mom, of course. But you know what? I wouldn't trade that dive for anything. Dr. Figueroa uses her passion for STEM to discover new things and make the world a better place. She can STEM, so can you. Check out She Can STEM for more stories and inspiration. A message from the Ad Council. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetRootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. I'm
I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1925. 500 African-American sleeping car porters gathered at the Elks Hall at 129th Street in Harlem. The meeting was called by A. Philip Randolph. The purpose of the meeting was to form an independent black labor union for the sleeping car workers. The porters were service workers on the popular Pullman train sleeping cars. They were paid low wages and worked as many as 400 hours a month with no overtime pay. They could not be promoted to other jobs within the Pullman company. Those were reserved for white workers. They faced daily acts of discrimination on the job. Many of the porters became increasingly determined to change these working conditions by forming a union. There was a company union, but it did not represent the demands of the workers. But talking about an independent porters union was a good way to get fired from the Pullman company. A group of porters reached out to a young black rights activist, A. Philip Randolph. They asked him to lead the union charge. As an outsider to the company, he could be the face of the union without facing the threat of being fired. Randolph accepted their offer. He organized the meeting in Harlem. An American flag and large union banner draped the stage. Randolph opened the meeting with a prayer as temperatures in the packed room soared to 90 degrees. From the stage, Randolph issued a rallying cry for reduced hours, increased wages, and most importantly, dignity at the workplace. It would take 12 long years of struggle after that meeting, but the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters would become the nation's first black labor union. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Like us on Facebook and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 62 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs around 100 again, oh my... And we should have uh, plentiful sunshine throughout the day with winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Clear skies overnight with lows in the low 60s. Winds will have shifted out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10. And then mainly sunny tomorrow. Highs in the low to mid 90s. Winds shifting back out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon have been updated. We now stand at 498,089 confirmed cases, and our deceased have, in, have increased by two and now stands at 572. Grass pollen is rated low right outside the window here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 31 parts per million. And that daytime UV index remains in the high range at level 7. Barometric pressure is rising at 29.98 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 82%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 72 and mostly cloudy. Paris is 88 and sunny with a heat advisory. Rome is 90 degrees and fair. Kiev is 88 and sunny. Kabul is 60 degrees with light rain. Hong Kong is 80 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 80 and cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 52 and mostly cloudy. 
San Francisco, California is 58 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 85 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is Weather from Around the World, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Anonymous staff at Reuters brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A Mexican judge ruled there was sufficient evidence to hear charges against former Attorney General Jesus Murillo for his role in the 2014 disappearance of 43 students and its subsequent investigation. Murillo, who was arrested on Friday in the first high-level detention of an official for involvement in the case, is accused of torture, forced disappearance, and obstruction of justice. The country's top prosecutor at the time, Murillo, oversaw the highly criticized inquiry into the incident in which 43 students from the Azantanapa Rural Teachers College went missing in the southwest state of Guerrero. His arrest comes after Mexico's top human rights investigator called the disappearances a state crime last week, marking one of the worst human rights abuses in the country's history. International experts have said Murillo's investigation, which concluded the students had been mistakenly killed by a local drug gang, was riddled with missteps and abuses, including the torture of witnesses. Murillo defended himself during the indictment hearing. According to local media, for seven years they've been looking for an alternative account of events. They have invented many and they all fall apart, Murillo said. I can accept some mistakes. Mistakes could be made. I can accept things that were done wrong, but no one has been able to bring down my investigation, he added. Murillo will remain in prison until his trial. President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador took office at the end of 2018, promising to look into the disappearances. Last week, a judge released nearly 100 arrest warrants related to the case. The remains of only three of the students have ever been definitively identified. Je te donne, c'est mon amour, pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers C'est tout Frank Jordans of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Germany will keep exporting electricity to neighboring France despite calling on people to help fend off winter shortages by saving energy at home. Problems at French nuclear plants have driven up electricity prices there in recent months, prompting power companies in neighboring countries to sell excess energy to France. It's another sign of the energy crisis gripping Europe. Both natural gas and electricity prices have hit record highs, with power costs ballooning as Russia reduces gas flows to Germany and other countries and renewables and nuclear contributing less to the power mix lately, analysts at Reichstag Energy said. High energy prices are driving inflation 
and fueling the prospect of a recession in Europe. Well, well, well. That brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver